Reading for March 14th, Science of Mind, A Philosophy, A Faith, A Way of Life by Ernest Holmes. Reading from page 266, paragraph 1, through page 271, paragraph 1, using inclusive language. The Principles of Successful Living. Not Something for Nothing. Lessons on prosperity and mental control of conditions are sometimes dangerous because of the misunderstanding of this subject. Science of mind is not a get-rich-quick scheme, neither does it promise something for nothing. It does, however, promise the one who will comply with its teachings that they shall be able to bring greater possibilities and happier conditions into their experience. We do not teach that you can get what you want. If we could all get what we want, it might be disastrous, for it is certain that most of us would want things that would interfere with the well-being of someone else. While we could not expect to demonstrate that which is contrary to the nature of our own existence, we not only believe, but we know that it is entirely possible through mental treatment, through right thought and belief, to greatly influence our environment, its reaction to us, the situations we meet, and the conditions we contact, contact. There is some, there is such a thing as demonstrating a control of conditions. We shall be able to prove this in such degree as we are successful in looking away from the conditions which now exist while accepting better ones. Not only must we accept this intellectually, but our acceptance must become a subjective embodiment of which the intellect, intellect furnishes but a mental picture. Consequently, this science does not promise something for nothing. It does, however, tell us that if we comply with the law, the law complies with us. No person can demonstrate peace and cling to unhappiness. We can demonstrate resignation and call it peace, but it will not be peace. No person can jump into the water and remain dry. This is contrary to law and to reason. No person whose entire time is spent in the contemplation of limitation can demonstrate freedom from such limitation. The law itself must be willing to give, because in so giving, life is self-expressed. The law is infinite. The science of mind is based entirely upon the supposition that we are surrounded by a universal mind into which we think. This mind, in its original state, fills all space. It fills the space that we use in the universe it is in us as well as outside us. As we think into this universal mind, we set a law in motion, which is creative and which contains within itself a limitless possibility. The law through which we operate is infinite, but we appear to be finite. That is, we have not yet evolved to a complete understanding of ourselves. We are unfolding from a limitless potential, but can bring into our experience only that which we can conceive. There is no limit to the law, but there appears to be a limit to our understanding of it. As our understanding unfolds, our possibilities of attainment will increase. It is a great mistake to say, take what you wish, for you can have anything you like. We do not take what we wish, but we do attract to ourselves that which is like our thought. We must become more if we wish to draw a greater good into our life. We need not labor under the delusion that all we have to do is to say that everything is ours. This is true in reality, but in fact, it is only as true as we make it. We provide the mold for the creative law, and unless the mold we provide is increased, substance cannot increase in our experience. For mental science, 
does not promise anything that will do away with the necessity of complying with law. The law is a law of liberty, but not a law of license. It is exact and exacting, and unless we are willing to comply with its nature and work with it along the lines of its inherent being, we shall receive no great benefit. Every person must pay the price for that which we receive, and that price is paid in mental and spiritual coin. All nature conspires to produce and manifest the freedom of the individual, that it may unloosen its own energy. We may be sure God is for us, whatever our conception of God may be, whatever our conception of the relationship of Jesus and the idea of Christ to humanity and God and our own salvation may be, this thing must act in accordance with definite law in the universe. And this law says that whenever and wherever there is an adequate subjective image which does not contradict the nature of the universe, that image will not only tend to take form but will take form and will manifest. This law we did not make and we cannot change. But this teaching should not be confused with the idea that we can show people how to get what they want regardless. True prayer must be, thy will be done. But the implication relative to the will of the divine in this prayer is not a submission to the inevitability of evil or limitation. It is a knowledge that the will of the divine is always good. How do we know that the will of the divine is? We do not, other than this. The will of the divine cannot be death. Why? Because if we assume the divine to be the principle of life, the principle of life cannot produce death without destroying itself. The will of life has only to be life. The will of that which is infinite can never be finite. Everything then should tend to, be, to expansion and multiplication in the divine plan. That is the will of the divine. It has to be beauty truth and harmony, as Troward said, as this is the true relationship of the whole to the parts and the parts to the whole. Therefore, we should interpret the will of the divine to be everything that expresses life without hurt. This seems to be a fair, logical, sane, and intelligent criterion. Anything that will enable us to express greater life, greater happiness, greater power, so long as it does not harm anyone, must be the will of the divine for us. As much life as we can conceive will become a part of our experience. A mental avenue must be provided through which the law may operate as a law of liberty, if we are to be free. This does not mean we must please the law for it is impersonal and neither knows nor cares who uses it, nor for what purpose. But because it is impersonal, it is compelled by its very nature to return to the thinker exactly what we think into it. The law of mental equivalence must never be overlooked, for whatsoever a person soweth, that shall they also reap. If we are intelligent, we will naturally seek to free ourselves from misery and unhappiness. Theology may say that this is a selfish motivation, but it is exactly what we are all trying to do and calling it by a different name. Whether it is through the remission of sins or the salvation of the individual soul, every act in the life of the individual is that such an individual may express themselves. For instance, the love of a parent for their children a spouse for their partner, a patriot for their country, a preacher for their religion, an artist for their art. All of these are but ways of self-fulfillment. This is legitimate self-expression. We realize, however, 
that to attempt this self-expression at the expense of society or other individuals is to defeat the very purpose for which freedom exists, for back of all is a unity. Hence we find that the laws of necessity and not of theology, of which religions and ethics and moral and social systems are but feeble lights, do ultimately compel experience into the path of true righteousness. The criterion for any person as to what is right or wrong for them is not to be found in some other person's judgment. The criterion is, does the thing I wish to do express more life, more happiness, more peace to myself, and at the same time harm no one? If it does, it is right. It is not selfish. But if it is done at the expense of anyone, then in such degree we are making a wrong use of the law. We may be quite emphatic, saying that we think the universe exists for the expression of spirit, and we exist for self-expression because we are the expression of spirit. We do not exist for the purpose of making an impression upon the environment. We do exist to express ourselves in and through our environment. There is a great difference. We do not exist to leave a lasting impression upon our environment, not at all. It is not necessary that we leave any impression. It is not necessary if we should pass on tonight that anyone should remember that we have ever lived. All that means anything is that while we live, we live. And wherever we go from here, we shall keep on living. It is quite a burden lifted when we realize that we do not have to move the world. It is going to move anyway. This realization does not lessen our duty or our social obligation. It clarifies it. It enables us to do joyously and free from morbidity that which we should do in the social state. With this in mind and believing that there is an infinite law of spirit or law of life which tends to multiply our gifts because in so doing it multiplies its own experience, its own pleasure, its own fruition, we may assume that spiritual being is already a success, is already supplied with everything that we need. The potential of all things exists in the universal wholeness.